What's up, everybody, and welcome to Theory Underground. What you're about to listen to is a fantastic conversation that we had with Benjamin Studebaker not very long ago. Why does it matter? Well, I really want to get this out right now because it's about something that I think we kind of need to clear the air on, and that is that people think we are anti-academic, that people think that we you know, wholesale denounce, disavow, write off the academic institutions of our time. The fact is, this is not the case. There are courses that you can take and there are programs you can get into that are so worthwhile, so worthwhile, that if you can get into them, you really ought to do it. Take advantage of the opportunities given to you. Leverage whatever privilege that you have. Don't hold back just because these institutions are generally falling apart. If there are ones that are really good, we should tune in and care about why they're good. Because if you've been barred access to higher learning, the question is, or what kind of quality content is actually on the other side of that access? This conversation with Benjamin Studebaker that happened right before we went on our American Idiots uh, European tour gets into how awesome the political philosophy courses are at Cambridge University. Cambridge is one of the oldest universities. It's one of it's definitely one of the most prestigious universities of all time. And Benjamin Studebaker not only got degrees there, but he also taught political philosophy courses, three of them to be precise. And he taught them 10 times more often than his peers. Why this matters is because Studebaker is teaching us all here on the internet, right? And I want you to all get a sense for what we are missing out on and he had the ability to pursue because that's important. And hopefully we can gain from him. I gained a lot from him in this conversation. There's a lot that I've been thinking about since this conversation and I had a conversation with him recently, a private one, that is about some of the stuff that we're going to do in the very near future. So stay tuned for some really cool content coming. What else is coming? Well, starting on the 13th, which is in three days from the publication of this video, begins the introduction to Yvonne Illich with Brian Weeks. I want you to please check out the trailer for that that will be inserted I don't know, sometime in the middle of this video. If you're watching it way off in the future after the course has already taken place, it's still available after the fact. You can always take a Theory Underground course after the fact by watching the lectures. But there's something special about being there for the live course, of course. If you can, then do it. And if you can, please sign up before uh, this Thursday. So with that, um, enjoy this video. Stick around till the end to find out how to get involved or support. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to Theory Underground. I am your host, David McCarricker, and I'm joined by my favorite co-host, Nance. Welcome, Nance. And today we are joined by Benjamin Studebaker. How you doing, Benjamin? I'm great. It's great to be back. Yeah, it's good to have you. You've been on a lot recently, and you just gave an amazing lecture just two or three weeks ago on time energy before Descartes. Plato, Aristotle, and Confucius, time, energy, talent, tutelage. I've been talking about it so much. Anybody who's been around in the last few weeks has probably heard me say the th three cubed. For a while, I, was, I kept messing up and saying three squared. But no, three cubed, three Ts, um, time, energy, talent, tutelage. I told my students about that yesterday. It was my last uh, discussion section with them, and I told them about it, and they were just all like mind blown. I was trying to tell them that whether they're rich or poor, uh, or middle class, it doesn't matter. They come from broken homes if their parents were always stressed and worried about bills and working and not being able to be emotionally present or play games with them. And they were all just like, like, oh shit. You know, it was very clear that that was resonating with people. And I was thinking about how messed up it is that people who want to change the world don't start there, right? Uh, thank you, Anne. She just brought me the a copy, the copy that you sent me of The Chronic Crisis of American Democracy, The Way is Shut by Benjamin Studebaker. This book is amazing, everybody. I hope you'll check it out. I really like a lot of things about it, but I don't want to talk about it at all today. 
because Benjamin has been talking about this book way too much on the internet because that's what happens when you put a book out is everyone wants to talk about that book. And if we had all the time in the world, I would start by asking him about his previous book. But first, the real reason that we're here today is about is uh, the theme of learning and contradiction. And Benjamin has all kinds of interesting thoughts and insights into the conversation between Matt McManus and Spencer Leonard, as well as the conversation between Chris Catrone and Todd McGowan. Two of the con conversations we're very, very excited about today. But first, I want to focus on the, the learning side of things and just set the record straight for people who think we're anti-academy. -acad -acad A lot of people think we're anti-institution, anti-university, anti-academy. It's not true. That's wrong. Stop it, everybody. Don't do that. Stop telling people we're like that. That's not the case. Um, we're a bunch of burnouts, not because we're anti-university or the idea of the universal or anything like that, it's because the state universities are putting us into a ton of debt and then not even giving us what they say they're giving us. But a state university is not the same thing as a place like Cambridge. And it was a conversation that we were having about your experiences at Cambridge that made me just go, man, we just got to talk about the amazing opportunities afforded to you by that institution and really what everyone is kind of getting, uh, well, not getting. Right. By you talking about what you're able to get there, we can talk about what we're kind of getting robbed of because, you know, in a better society, we would actually have the opportunities for institutions that can provide real tutelage towards learning for its own sake. So with that, I don't know what you would like to say as way of uh, introduction in terms of your story in Cambridge, but really the floor is yours. Welcome. It's great to be here. Yeah. So I did a PhD at Cambridge and I taught at Cambridge for a number of years. I taught a lot more than is typical for Cambridge PhD students. I probably had about 10 times the standard teaching load by the end of it. So I taught, uh, we had three different classes. We call them papers, uh, classes on uh, the history of political thought. You know, one from the beginning to 1700, one from 1700 to 1890, and one from 1890 to the present. I also taught, uh, we had a couple of introductory classes for first year students, the modern state and its alternatives, and a, a class on international politics. I taught a political philosophy course for the philosophy department, and uh, a course called Evidence and Argument for History and Politics students, jointly with somebody in history. Uh, and I interviewed students with uh, an anthropologist. So I, I worked a lot with a lot of other departments in the university, and I, I taught just really big pile of stuff. And the thing that always sticks out to me is that a lot of people think that with elite universities, all you're really getting is name recognition or something. There was a friend of mine once who uh, said to me that he really thought that it didn't matter where you went to college, as long as you tried hard and you cared. And if you tried hard and you cared, you would learn just as much going to a state university as, as Cambridge. And I just, I was quiet because I didn't want to upset him because I knew the reason he was saying that particularly to me is that he was feeling like there was something missing about his experience, but he didn't know what it was. He wasn't sure whether there was something missing. Uh, and if there was, he, he couldn't describe it. And I would say that the thing that is really missing, there are a couple of things. So one is, the supervision system, or at Oxford, they call them tutorials. So that's the one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two system where you write over the course of the year, six 2000 word essays per class that you take. And you have an academic who reads those essays, who gives you comment, comments and feedback on those essays, and then meets with you to discuss those essays for an hour as part of the normal routine, not an office hour that you have an option to go to, but as part of what everybody does, mandatory. And those essays don't count for points. So you can experiment in them, but you're expected to do them. And the reason that you're going to do them, if you are someone who wouldn't be intrinsically motivated to do them, is the shame that you will feel in that meeting for an hour, often with a peer as you don't know what you're talking about, you can't participate in the conversation effectively and you feel bad. So there's a little bit of an honor and status aspect to it, a little bit of a peer competition thing that's created. Uh, but also at the same time, 
you know, for the vast bulk of students, they're intrinsically motivated to do this because they're getting feedback from someone who's an expert in the field. And it would be incredibly foolish to waste that opportunity. So very few people do waste it. And very rarely does it have to be a negative experience. So that, that... in addition to that, oh, sorry, keep going. Yeah, please. All right. So in addition to the one to one stuff, the other thing that we've got is reading lists that are comprehensive, that include far more than anybody could read on their own. So for one course, we'll have like two dozen topics, right? Each of those topics will have a reading list that could be as long as the syllabus for a single course in the United States. You, over the course of the year, would only do six of those topics because you get six 2,000-word essays, right? So in a course that's got, say, 24 or 30 topics, you're going to do just six. And then for each of those essays, you're not going to read the whole reading list for each essay because you won't have time because you're not just doing this course. You do four different courses at once. So you're doing 24 topics over the course of the year spread across six different courses. And you are made aware you are only reading a small portion of the things you've been given. What you've been given is a small portion of what exists on the topic. And you have been given the resources so that if you want to read about these other topics or go into this other stuff that we don't have the resources to do individually with you, you've got that permanently for the rest of life. You've got those syllabi with those reading lists. And so if you want to start studying one of these topics, and I do this now. If I am interested in reading about or talking about some part of what I taught at Cambridge, I go to that reading list and I read the stuff that we gave to undergraduates. I look back over that stuff because that stuff is good. In the States, oftentimes they don't even give you primary text to read. They give you a reader. They give you something to help you with it. They give you some secondary material. They're not even comfortable in many cases giving you proper journal articles to read because they think you won't read those. So you don't have the stuff to read. You don't know what to read. You don't know where to begin with what to read. And those reading lists include intentionally different conflicting perspectives on the material. So in the secondary literature, you're going to have some people who interpret uh, the material in one way and some people who interpret it in very, very different ways, you're going to get a sense that for each of those topics, there's at least three or four different quite important views about how to interpret that theorist or how to answer the normative questions that that topic engages. Nobody's going to be saying you're going to get a good grade if you agree with the professor. Indeed, if you parrot the lecture in your papers or on the exams, you're going to get a worse mark. If you say exactly what the professor said in class without adding anything of your own, you're not going to get a first class mark. You'll get what in the UK we call a 2-1, which means you showed up, you paid a, a certain level of attention, your argument makes a certain amount of sense, but it's not original and it's not necessarily something that we would go, okay, let's keep this person on for a master's degree or PhD. We use the distinction, the marking system, it's first, two, one, two, two, third, fail. The vast majority of people get two ones. And we use the first to show this person is doing something special that goes beyond. And because of that, the distinction between a first and a two one is nebulous. If you tell someone didactically, here's how to get a first, it wouldn't be a first anymore. It would cease to be a first if you could be told how to get it. And undergraduate students have a difficult time grasping this because they're accustomed to the secondary system where you do what you're told, you get a good score. There is no doing what you're told and getting a first. To get a first, you must be someone who doesn't just do what they're told. And that's in the education system from the beginning. That is pretty much the kind of structure that is missing at the state university, especially in the United States. Um, I'm not going to speak for all state universities. There's probably some amazing ones. And I know that, for instance, I don't know if it counts as a state university, but uh, University of New Mexico, um, like they have an amazing philosophy department with, you know, Dr. Ian Thompson and Adrian Johnson, a couple of friends of the channel. Uh, but it's really a hub for like, you know, philosophy that's pretty cutting edge and they have a lot of other people doing important work there. 
but you know, exceptions prove the rule. And the 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 sad state of things at our university at Boise State. Um, look, it was still better than not going. I do I do genuinely believe that it was worthwhile uh, because it's what it. I owe a debt to the professors that I did meet along the way who did hold me to higher standards, who do live and breathe their fields. They were just rare and they themselves are um, hindered from really excelling and doing what they love uh, by the the bureaucratic glut, the constant administration of everything, blah, blah, blah. Um, but without all that said, I mean, without that experience on my side, I also wouldn't have ever gotten into doing Theory Underground right? Because it was the conversations with uh, fellow travelers who I met there mostly uh, that led to the various experiments that culminated in what has become Theory Underground. And so, you know, but I, that disillusionment comes through and then people get the sense that we're anti-academia or that we're even anti-standards. I mean, I feel bad because the last year of classes at Theory Underground, people have, it's like, oh, write a piece if you want to write a piece uh, write a reflection if you want to write a reflection, whatever. You know, we talk this big game of trying to build this milieu out of the scene and go beyond the the tendencies of the medium. But in reality, we're not doing it. In reality, um, we're not anywhere close to where we could be. And we're just a bunch of jack-offs on the internet. And I do genuinely believe that there's potential here. I do genuinely believe that there is, but only with proper tutelage. And, and, and so when I saw it, when you were telling me about all this stuff and I was like looking at these, you, you sent me some of these syllabi and I was like, Oh my God. Yeah, this is, this is it. And, and, and the, it's weird because it's like, if we're all very busy people, we're working, we're, you know, a lot of us are working with earbuds in and, and, and listening to these books and then trying to write when we get home. And, and it's, it's, it's not easy, but also, it's harder when you don't have some kind of a structure and that, that accountability structure that you're talking about where there is some kind of like honor and shame potential in the activity itself. Symbolically, it is set up structurally so that you can excel. Without that, we're, we're, we have even like the odds, are, the, the odds are stacked against us, right? And so Nance, as someone who's taken all of the courses at Theory Underground, do you want to complain about how much the lack of structure has sucked uh, for a second and, and turn that into a question somehow for Benjamin, or do you have anything else that you would like to say that, that he's provoked? Um, yeah, the, this, this lack of standards. Uh, it's funny because yeah, people do say we're anti-standards, but then also there are other people who say we're too scholastic. And I think that's yep, funny. Yep. Yep. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, it, it like I did, I'll say some of the best writing I've I've ever done um kind of in in that first part where it was the idea of the university and the and the PMC and the beginning of the Zizek course um and and I've definitely fallen off and I think part of that is yeah I just just getting too busy um to to really do it and trying to do everything all at once and as a consequence not really being able to do anything um but i feel like like benjamin your essay or your lecture the other couple of weeks ago has already made its way into multiple essays that like i'm writing right now um this kind of framework of the tutelage and, and the talent and like there ha we have to find a way to develop a back and forth or a give and take um with the students or the learners um and maybe not the instructors as such but the the framework itself so providing accountability providing this um yeah potential for recognition um or potential for correction i don't know shame is kind of a kind of a weird word but like i feel like it it it's totally unproblematic in Cambridge or like in this university framework, but us trying to do that outside of the institutions, it, it feels weird to say the word shame. While I think it can be understood to mean like it's this positive peer pressure, um, shame just feels like a, a weird word. And I think some people might get 
the wrong idea. Um, but I don't know, like, how, how best do you think could we develop kind of this uh, positive peer pressure outside of the institution? Again, you know, maintaining our renegade, we're all assholes status. <laughs> Yeah, Must that's be maintained. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At at in the UK, the stereotype of Oxford and Cambridge is that it's very intimidating, and that you'll come into these sessions and people will be, you know, the supervisor will take your paper and stick it in a shredder or something. You know, that's the stories that people have heard from the seventies about what supervisors at Oxford and Cambridge used to do. So when I'm dealing with British students, the thing I have to do is is get them comfortable. Right. In the States, oftentimes it's it's we need to have standards and it's talking about you know, what what it would even mean to begin to have standards in the UK. It's about, hey, yeah, we're going to have standards, but I, I care about you as a person and I'm not trying to break your spirit. And to not break somebody's spirit, you have to get a sense for what kind of feedback works for them. You don't just give the same feedback to every student. You have to get to know the students. So you start with a baseline that isn't exactly right for anybody. And then as you get to know the particular people, because you're seeing them one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, you figure out over the course of the year, what's the best way? Is this someone who needs more positive motivation? Is it someone who needs more negative motivation? Is it someone who needs a mix? A, a lot of the time, I would, uh, in the margins of the paper, be kind of harsh, but then in person, be much more supportive. Or I might, if I'm dealing with a student who's working in English as a second language, I might be very, very thorough in the text itself correcting mistakes. But in the margins, I might go, you know, it's really impressive that you can write at all mm. about this abstract stuff in English. That's incredible. I, you know, I can't do that in your language. I couldn't even begin. So I, this, this requires actually getting to know your student. And one of the disadvantages of, of the university as an idea is that it, it moved away from this personal relationship with the students that the old monastic system in the early Middle Ages was built around, right? In the monasteries, you have to know the soul. The pedagogue has to know the condition of the soul of the person to be able to make the right intervention for that person. And an intervention that would be helpful to one person might actually be harmful to somebody else. And so to understand that and be able to it, decide what is this moment, what does this person need from me and give it to them requires, A, a, a lot of, of personal character, you know, prudence, wisdom, and ability to see what's going on. And B, you know, actual time with the person to really get to know who they are. The university system wanted to scale this up and make it more accessible. And to scale it up and make it more accessible, it becomes the lecture model. Somebody gives a talk, it's the same talk every year or the same talk for everybody in the room. And all the people in the room hear the talk and regardless of where they come in, where they're from, they hear the same talk. And that has an advantage insofar as it allows you to scale things up very quickly, right? And right now, you all who are listening, you're all listening to me say the same thing. I don't know you, I don't know where you're at or what you need. Some of the things I'm saying are gonna hit you well, and some won't hit you as well because of your situation and my ignorance of it. And if you and I were together over the course of a year in a supervision setting, I'd get to know you and you'd get to know me and we'd develop an understanding of each other that we could use to be much more effective. But it's very difficult to scale that at the kind of cost that governments and private universities are able to bear. So we have a lot of universities that run on the lecturing system because it's not possible to financially support this level of, of interaction for everybody. And then we have to rationalize this and go, well, everybody's still getting a university degree. It's just that some people's university degrees involve certain things that other people's university degrees don't involve. And then, you know, the tragic thing in the States is that a lot of the elite universities have really abandoned the, the standards. So in addition to problems with state universities, you've got a lot of these Ivy League schools that have uh, become focused on giving the students A's so that the students look good and get return on investment. 
So once you start thinking about the student as a customer, if I'm different from the other professors in the school, if I have standards and the other professors don't, or if our university has standards and other universities that compete with it don't, the effect of that is if you're at my university, you're going to learn more, but you're going to look like you've learned less because you're going to get grades or marks that are worse than other people's, even though you know more than those other people do because you've been held to a standard. And that becomes completely untenable when you're thinking about the university as a, as a job market institution. And that's what it's become as it's be scaled up and up and up. It includes more and more people. But to do that, it has to be economically viable for the students. It has to be economically viable for those who are funding the universities. And all of this distorts what the university is able to be. In the UK, we call this marketization of the university. The program will resume shortly, right after this DIY commercial that is not for any sponsor other than ourselves. Thank you for watching. Whether we are already fully in the grip of the techno-capital AI singularity or not, we likely feel as though there's not much we can do. As allies of future generations, we aren't giving up so easily. To quote the author of Manifesto, the Mad Farmer, Liberation Front. We wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what our life and our children's lives may be. This fear is not new. The question of technology, media, and institutions became unavoidable in the 20th century. Yet when we think of institutions, the most radical critiques people have encountered came from either Michel Foucault or Jürgen Habermas. These thinkers towered over the theory seen in the 1970s and 80s as radicals took their long march through the institutions. When it comes to theories of social change, the tendency is to put our hopes in leaving the existing institutions, the current order failing, or some overnight revolution to bring us salvation. Otherwise, we lean in and do the best we can with what's afforded by the existing institutions. Reform or revolution. Nothing ever changes, so we keep putting our hopes in education. So progressives say, if only more people had access to better education, then that would solve the problems. But they have not thought seriously enough about the nature of our institutions, or this thing called education that they offer. The most radical critiques of schooling that teachers encounter issue from Paulo Freire, Bell Hooks, and Henry Giraud, but none of these ever got to the root of institutions themselves. The theorist who did this was Ivan Illich. Gaining brief stardom in the 70s, Ivan Illich was the father of the de-schooling movement, inspiring hundreds of radical schools and generations of homeschooling parents. But this characterization of his work as the anti-school guy was his ultimate demise. But that only takes account of a surface level of his work. Illich was immediately misunderstood and quickly abandoned. The issue goes far beyond schools. We spend our entire lives mediated through institutions that totalize, instrumentalize, and reduce humans, all of our possibilities, to something predictable, calculable, and exchangeable, easy to control. The interests of state and capital here overlap entirely. Our desires are thus turned into commodities and our time energy into labor power. Illich doesn't stop here, though, for institutions are not the whole picture. When people think of schooling today, they think of studying for exams not learning for the sake of learning. When people think of hospitals, they think of treating illnesses, not human to human care and well-being. When people think of transportation, they think of speed and efficiency, not the possibility of sustained, regular, and meaningful connections. When people think of reading, they think of collecting information, not lingering with an idea, the move from schooling to school A requires serious inquiry into the conditions of possibility for this mode. I'm calling for a sincere and earnest revival of Illich. While most introductions to Illich limit their engagement to his earlier works, a series of polemics against schooling and institutionalized consumer society, I want to go deeper and lead us to a more robust understanding of who and what a human is for Illich. With his help, we will reopen the question of what we are, what we can be, and the types of lives we are willing to give our time and energy to bring into being, if there are to be humans in the future. This course begins on June 13th, 
and goes through July 4th, 2024. It meets on Thursdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can enroll at theoryunderground.com forward slash courses forward slash illich hyphen one or just click on the link in the description. For those who just want to spend a month really thinking about schooling and institutions, this is a fantastic way to do so. But for those who are looking to go deeper with a community of truth seekers who are going beyond the current theory scene to form an intellectual milieu, this is a fantastic way to do so because the Theory Underground 2024 conference at the end of October 23rd through 27th is going to have special panels for presentations related to this course. Any student of this course will have opportunities to present and those presentations can ultimately culminate in submissions that may be accepted into the anthology we are doing on the critique of schooling and education to be published either at the end of this year or at the beginning of 2025. Thank you. We hope to see you there. So what do you think we should do for people who don't have time energy um, and are super busy uh, and are probably, you know, parents, uh, let's be honest, most of the people at Theory Underground have a couple of kids and like uh, our demographic is like 90% male in 35 to 40. Like I can see this stuff on, on YouTube. Uh, the rest are women anywhere between 25 and uh, 40. And so, uh, and, and, but the, the, the guys are almost always like obsessives who are getting into theory, who used to probably be addicts who are either addicted to opioids or cocaine. That's pretty common at Theory Underground. Um, and it's, it's like a, it's a funny kind of thing that keeps coming up, especially with the Coke thing. Cause I never did cocaine. I never did it. Um, I always knew I that it would cocaine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just had yeah. to interject. I always knew, I always knew that it would mess up my drive. Like, or I, I like maybe I had a deep superstition that it would mess up my drive because I'm pretty naturally inspired all the time. And so when people would describe Coke, I would, I would always be like, that sounds like how I always am. And I actually have to smoke just to calm down sometimes like pot, you know? And so for me, I'm always just like, I don't know what would happen, but I don't want to find out because what if it messed that up for me? Like just kind of superstitious like that. But then I think that people get like this kind of like, oh, they're not doing Coke all the time anymore. So they're trying to do something else. And I bring that energy, that sort of natural uh, crackhead energy to, to the situation, I guess. And so um, we, we got a bunch of oddballs who are getting into philosophy. They want to figure out like, what's the good life. They're not just a bunch of Zizekians. They're not just a bunch of Landians. They're also into Plato and Aristotle, or at least interested in getting into the ancients and le learning multiple languages, but they're strapped for time energy. They're strapped for cash and their wives are probably looking at them going, okay, what are you doing now? Like, what's this? What are you doing now? Like, what are you doing for real? Hold on, and dude. On that note, being in this volume, helped me justify the long hours um, that I spent, you know, reading, reading philosophy texts on the internet. Like, how do you even explain that to someone? But then to turn around and have something concrete, which is what we're trying to do, developing the milieu. Um, it is something to show for yourself and take it to your partner, your friends, your family, whatever your situation is and, and justify it, which is why, again, comes back to why these standards matter. Um, it's not so much that we just want the recognition or we want no. to get a good job. How the hell is any of this going to help me get a better job? Um, we really want to contribute to this developing milieu. And so, yeah. so yeah, what, what kind of stuff comes to mind? Obviously this is the beginning of a conversation we could have over years and years, but just off the top of your head, I'm wondering what you might have. Yeah, so what immediately comes to my mind, right, is if you've got a full-time student at Cambridge, you have four different classes, so six essays per class, so 24 essays per academic year, plus the revision 
uh, mock exams and the, the exam at the end of the year. That obviously is too much for anybody to do, right? So then there's a question, I think, of what would be the amount of something rigorous that actually can fit into a regular person's life, right? So instead of dropping the rigor, reduce the amount of the rigorous, right? So instead of 24 essays, could you do six in a year? and take effectively one Cambridge class, which would be one fourth of that load for the full year, right? Not even half time. Could you do six? And then what you could do is you could do six essays and you could distribute them. So a typical uh, Cambridge term for each class, you'd have an essay due every two weeks during the term time. So you'd have three essays due over an eight week term, each two weeks apart. And you'd have four different classes running at the same time. So a lot of the time, these essays would be due the same week and it would be awful, right? And the students would be really stressed out and miserable as a consequence of that. And I would try to, I, I let students move their supervisions around a lot. I had a system that let students move their supervisions because I knew that having some flexibility on the time that you have to have it done by would help people. But it's it's just way too much. But what if you say, okay, if you're only gonna do six of these in a year, you could do them every other month instead of once every two weeks. And maybe we're going to do more topics than you're going to have to write on. So most weeks, you wouldn't have something to do, and you just get to listen and learn and have fun. And only in those weeks where somebody wrote an essay would we talk about the essay. Then maybe we could have 2,000-word essays over the course of the year that would then prepare you to write something that could go into a book. Mm. And it mm -hmm. only goes into the book if it's actually good. Right, right, right. Which is, uh, I would say I'm proud of everything that is in the Underground Theory volume, though the standards have gone up because there is less room in the in the, the upcoming volumes. And so instantly it's like, it's like, oh yeah, we just, we were working with what we had and we were like, this is all really good. But now that it's like, oh, the student base has quadrupled. There's a lot more, especially once you have Zizek's name on it or, you know, Nina Power's name on it. Like everyone's like, oh, well now I actually want in. And so as soon as you have that, that kind of, that street cred, we don't do anything for credit, but we do have street cred now. There are more people wanting in and some people are out here like sharpening their knives, like they're in the woodshed, just, you know, sharpening all their tools, writing just to practice for the pieces that they'll be writing for these anthologies. So we really do, I think, uh, we are moving in the direction that you're kind of signaling here. Like in the last month and a half, we've had two writing related events with, uh, our guy, Andy, who has a PhD in, uh, rhetoric and composition. And, uh, he, yeah, and he studied under Todd McGowan. He's a really cool guy. Everyone should subscribe to his Substack, which is called Hello Gorgias. Go ahead and share that in the chat if you could, Nance. Yep. But so Hello Gorgias, he puts out like a weekly, you know, tip for writers. Like he just put out one on the believing game on critique versus criticism and how, you know, the believing game is to say like, okay, criticism is cheap. It's easy. You sit there and you pick apart everything. The believing game is like you get into the headspace and the shoes of the author and you try to like live it inside out. Obviously Hegel did this, Marx did this, you know, all the greats. And so this is a uh, this is our writing coach and he can't really do it full time for the next week, by the way, he's giving free consultations people. So get a hold of him ASAP. Those are worth a hundred bucks a pop, but he's doing it for free for the following week. And if you want, and if anybody's look, anybody who's watching this, who wants to submit proposals for the theory underground conference in October 23rd through 27th, um, those are due June 1st. And currently we have the call for proposal session. And the uh, proposal writing workshop session, both of those I can send you if you just reach out to me and say you want it. We're just doing stuff word of mouth. There's not a general call for proposals that's circulating on the internet. It's all word of mouth and that's just the way it has to be. Um, I, 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 there's a lot of people that I'm soliciting where I'm like, they might not be a student or like a direct fellow traveler theory underground, but I'm like, Hey, it's a real thing. What you're doing is really interesting. Might you be interested in being in one of these anthologies that's related to something 
that you're doing. And so far, we're getting really positive feedback. And so, yeah, a lot of people, they're working on their craft. They're interested in the writing workshop. I think we're going to have an actual writing class that's going to go for eight weeks through June and July. And uh, we'll hopefully have that class posted in the first week of May. So you can sign up for that. Spots are going to go really, really quick. There's only eight spots for the actual writing workshop component of it. We are assuming the lowest tier of people are too busy to actually do the writing workshop part. And so they're only going to have access to the lectures. But at the end of every lecture, Andy's going to explain what we're going to do in the workshop. And then for you, like let's just say that you're stocking groceries at a grocery store or you're driving a truck for Amazon or what have you, and you're hearing the lecture for that. The fact is, is you can't be there for the workshop in person with us, but we're priming you to be able to do it in the future because that's how I am. I If, if there's something that I want to do or I want to dive in deep on and I know that the learning curve is too big for the time energy I have that week or month, while I have the interest, I can at least prime myself so that next time I have the drive, I could dive in a lot deeper maybe a year later. And so we're assuming that there's some people like that who will be at tier one maybe 20 people like that at tier one, but there's only eight spots for the actual workshop component of this class. And those are going to be the people who are most serious about honing their craft for these anthologies. And so, yeah, I'm like staring at the camera here because I'm like, audience, listen up, do it. But if you're on the podcast side, you don't even know about that. But hey, just email hello dot theoryunderground at gmail.com if you want the links to the call for proposals session where we explain the topics of the eight different anthologies that we're putting out and if you want the uh, writing workshop it's a great thing that Andy puts us through like he really deconstructs it and then just like it's very simple like this is what a proposal needs and this is why it needs these things and And here's how simple it can be. And then you can fluff it up later. But just in 10 minutes, you'll have your proposal together. And the proposal is not for an actual paper that you have to present. It's for research that you're doing to present at the conference. And then a lot of people will have written their papers at that point. But you can write your paper after that point. Or you can finish finalizing your paper after October 23rd through 27th. You'll have two weeks until November 15th to submit the final product. And you might be a part of the conference, you might be part of the class, and you still might not get accepted. Better luck next time, or it just might not fit, and maybe we'll find a way to make it fit into something else, or there'll be some other associated uh, endeavor people that we work with in the milieu that we will recommend you try to publish it through because we're not the only people out here doing this right now. Philosophy Portal is putting out anthologies like crazy, doing conferences like crazy. And we we think that there's like a, a lot of synergy between what Theory Underground and Philosophy Portal are doing, hopefully even more after the tour because we'll be talking to Cadell, brainstorming, et cetera. Okay, that's my plug. I did want to get that out because that is coming up soon. Also, Benjamin, it gives you a sense for, hey, we are putting some thought into it but we're not anywhere close to where we want to be. And so you're hundred percent right. And so really looking forward to uh, honing this in and refining it with you and others over the next uh, year to two years. But well, we've got another 20 minutes here. So, or at least 15 before we got to roll the PSA. So with that sort of plug out of the way, let's bring it back around here um, to whatever we want to talk about for the next 15 minutes. Yeah. You know, I, I think what you're doing is really important because we are in a crisis for theory where there's a question of where can people do theory? Where can people get access to theory? And the university system is not performing that function in the way that it used to do, in the way that uh, you know a, a small handful of universities used to do, really. And so if people can't get access to those that handful of universities how are they supposed to get this kind of stuff and you know a lot of uh, people on the left have been talking about the collapse of associations and the loss of places to talk to people about the stuff that matters to us there's a question there about what kinds of associations are possible that can perform all of the necessary functions right because we talk about how you know one of the functions of an association in modernity or in liberal capitalism is to actually constitute people as citizens, as people who are capable of acting effectively, right? It's not just a place to hang out. Mm -hmm. 
And there's been this, this loss, not just of associations in general, but of the specific kinds of associations that perform that socializing, educating function. And I, I've often been thinking in recent years about those medieval monasteries and the, the way in which the fact that Cambridge was more like a monastery than a regular university is what made it special. And when I say monastery, I'm really talking about monasteries as they used to exist in the Middle Ages. You know, and it wasn't just a group of older people who had dropped out and become ascetics, but when they actually performed an extremely important role in educating and socializing elites, aristocrats, bishops, important people in that society and in those communities. You know, or even if you think further back to the old philosophical circles in ancient Greece, you know, all those platonic dialogues, those are really just advertisements to convince you to come to Athens and start talking to Plato. Come and be in conversation, in dialogue. That's why it's all in dialogue, right? It's not just a treatise, because a treatise would hit people in different ways and it would lead to confusion for many of them. The real invitation is to come and talk, because if you talk, then Plato can figure out what it is that needs to be said to you. And until you're in conversation with him, he's not going to figure that out. And in many of the dialogues, it's not just that Socrates needs to figure out how to talk to the person in front of him. It's also that the person in front of him makes him realize there are things he needs to think about differently or talk about differently or do differently. People who read the dialogues and think, oh, Socrates is always Plato's opinion unmediated, uh, miss a big, big part of it, which is that oftentimes it's Socrates who needs to become a little bit more practical in his thinking. He needs to realize, hey, the stuff he's been doing is not going to work for Glaucon. He's going to think that that city is a city for pigs. He's not going to be impressed with it. He wants to be comfortable. He wants certain things that Socrates doesn't care about. And if Socrates doesn't take that into account, Glaucon's going to be alienated. and Maybe he'll string him up and kill him. Who knows? So he's got to think about these things. And that comes out of, of actual interaction that has to occur in an institutionalized setting, it won't just happen spontaneously or of its own accord. And, and it has to be a ritualized. You know, a lot of these guys in antiquity, you know, like Yamblichus, uh, the Syrian from uh, the late Roman Empire, put all this emphasis on theurgy, on creating a kind of environment, a sensory environment that even involves, you know, lights and sounds and things that puts you in a headspace where you are receptive to higher kinds of ideas or higher ways of thinking. And he even argued that uh, you know, pure philosophical discussion won't be enough if it doesn't have this theurgic aspect, that it needs this kind of environment to it. And I think a lot of the time when we look at you know, religious organizations and, and what happens when you go into a mosque or what happens when you go into a church, people see it as kind of silly. You know, why are people kneeling and, and doing all of these physical acts? You know, why do they have incense? Why all the colors and things? It's about trying to put you in a mood that makes you receptive. The music, all of this stuff is about creating a sense of mood. And when you think about all of teaching as, as about theurgy, about creating an experience for people that invites them to you know, they talk about it as an invitation for the divine to enter, for a divine presence to appear. And that can sound really aloof and, and difficult to get your head around, but it's this, it's this sense of being part of the, of the unity of the cosmos that comes from carefully, carefully constructing the environment in a particular way. And so if it starts to not work, if a particular way of, of doing it no longer has that function, then you have to start to change how it's done. You have to create new institutional forms. You have to create new rituals. You have to create new ways of, of interacting. You can't stay rigidly committed to something because it worked for somebody else in a different time, a different generation, at a different moment in history. You have to constantly reinvent these institutions and reinvent these ritual forms. Uh, and that's the thing that uh, I'm really interested in trying to combine this modern emphasis on the idea that a lot more people are talented than anybody realizes. And a lot of people are way more talented than anyone knows. With this ancient focus on, you know, what can we do with that talent? Uh, what is it that a talented person can do? It's a lot more than they've been asked to do for the last two or 300 years. You could be a lot more than just a successful business owner. You can be a lot more than just somebody who's bourgeois. You know, bourgeois is, is fine. But you can do better than that. 
A lot of people can do better than that, but the, it requires institutional support. And so I've been thinking a lot about, you know, what would it mean to, to say, you know, uh, let's make a Marxist monastery? What is that? Yeah, that that's kind of where I was about to take that. Yeah, actually was to say, well, to connect this to the contradiction conversation I'm going to be hosting between Samuel Lonkar and Justin Murphy today. You know, that's Christian atheism and Catholic accelerationism. But where, where they both agree is that religion is a set of spiritual technologies that are necessary for humans being able to do things together. And I that is not something that is accessible on the internet. Yeah, I, I, you can't... Go find the go find the videos for me, people, and send them to me. Let me know where you can find that information because I've been out here for a long time and looking into everything. And every time I got I caught the faintest whiff of this kind of idea, I'd like chase it down and look into it, and I couldn't find much more. And it's like, where's the books about this? Like, what what where's the where where are people getting this idea? And so I'm really excited to have them both on and get into it because like, I don't know, for philosophy of religion for me was just like, look at these people and how they do it. Look at these people and how they do it. It wasn't like this sort of sociological materialist approach to understanding it. And what you were just describing is like this curating or carefully constructing uh, environment. Uh, well, to put that in like Deleuzean terms, that's that you're tapping intensities where you are structuring intensities even that that bring out certain virtual capacities that people otherwise would not discover. And so right now with the internet, it's a new medium, it's a new ball game. We don't know what's possible, but also when you walk into a really old church in Europe, now that I've done it, I've been to the place where a part of Descartes is buried and it's like, oh, this is this is different. Like this is something, there's something special about this. Like, and it, you know, I've, I've heard these very biological reductivists like, oh, it's just because the ceiling is high. And it's also like, well, yeah, but also like you can tell that like an entire community sacrificed for a long time just to be able to have this. And then they put all their love and care into it. Like there's something about that too. Um, but I want to segue really quick to sort of setting you up. I, you kind of, I want to give you the floor uh, to close this thing out over the next uh, five to seven minutes. And uh, maybe we'll have a couple interjections along the way, but mostly I'm, I, I want to sort of abruptly switch gears to the other two contradiction conversations that come after that one, which is the Spencer, uh, Matt McManus one, uh, Spencer Leonard, Matt McManus one, and the Todd McGowan uh, and Chris Catrone won. Uh, you have thoughts about these, and uh, it kind of relates to the idea of a Marxist, um, what did you say, seminary? Uh, yeah, what, so what, what, are you, what are you thinking when you think about these two contradictions? What do you hope to see? Yeah, so one of the things I've noticed about Chris, and I think a big reason you're having Chris and Todd on together, is that Chris doesn't have Not much Todd. use for Lacan. Oh, you said Todd. Right. Sorry, I, th I thought you said yeah. I thought you said Tut, and I was like, no, it's not Tut. It's no, Todd. No. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, Todd. Yeah, yeah. Chris doesn't have much use for Lacan, and yet you know, Zizek and Todd and a lot of people do have a lot of use for Lacan and for psychoanalytic theory, right? And Chris kind of regards Lacan as an inferior, second-rate theorist that you shouldn't be wasting your scarce time energy on, right? So, at the same time, one of the things I've noticed Chris says a lot is that uh, you know, the labor unions are kind of captured by the, um, you know, what in his view would be kind of the Stalinist 20th century uh, state. They are embedded in the Democratic Party. They aren't radical. It's very diff difficult to radicalize them. Uh, and yet when people make the argument to Chris that this is part of the wider collapse of associations and associationism, he'll go, well, associationism hasn't gone away. There are still associations that are are active that have uh, give you independence from the state. They just tend to be religious organizations. And he'll start talking about moral majority in the 80s and the churches and the religious movement, right? So if uh, where we would start with reconstructing associations is religion, I think there's a question for Chris. 
as to what kinds of religious associations uh, ought to come into being or would be compatible with what he's looking to do, you know, as a as opposed to or in addition to labor unions or trade unions that he he feels are, are currently insufficient or not getting us where we need to go. And then if we're supposed to be interested in religion and Lacan and, and the psychoanalytic uh, stuff is not the point of entry into that, does he have a different point of entry? Uh, what would that point of entry be? Would he just say you know, uh, that, that you could find it in Marx? I don't know that that would be the answer. I think maybe there would be other stuff or maybe maybe not. I don't know. Uh, that's something I have always wanted to ask, Chris. Uh, the conversation between Spencer and uh, Matt McManus, there I think we're seeing some really different views about how you should read texts, right? Because Spencer is a historian, and he comes at texts with the methodology of a historian, where you need to understand how the text was understood imminently in its time. You need to understand uh, how the people in that time thought, what their concepts were, what they were responding to, who did they read? Yeah, and this is the wonderful thing about the historical method in political theory. It can reconstruct an entire moment in history, a whole culture, a whole way of thinking that has been lost to us or been made opaque to us. Platypus is quite keen on this sort of thing, but they're not the only organization that does this kind of stuff. A lot of the Cambridge School history of political thought stuff is about trying to reconstruct these historical moments. You know, Quentin Skinner, Raymond Goyce, the late John Pocock. There's loads and loads of these kind of Cambridge history of political thought people. There are whole journals devoted to, to this kind of stuff. And they focus on lots of different periods and, and moments. Uh, mainly in Western, in the Western tradition, but they're trying to branch out and to do this kind of method more thoroughly in other parts of the world, in other traditions in recent years. Uh, the, uh, you know, that's, I, I think, a very valuable way of doing it. But of course, Matt points at a different way of approaching theories and texts, which is repurposing something from the past, ripping it out of its context, and reorienting it to try to do something different with it from what was maybe originally intended. Uh, and maybe sometimes playing a little bit loose with the intentions of the original theorist for the purposes of not getting bound up in that discussion and to instead deploy the text in a more politically motivated way. And I think that a lot of the time, if we are want to think in new ways, we do have to take texts from the past and not interpret them just in the way in which they were originally understood because our context demands new ways of thinking. And one of the you know, long, long standing traditions in the history of thought that many, many theorists have engaged in is going to the classics, reading them with their own presentist context in mind, and then interpreting them in a way that serves their moment with uh, an indifference to the original interpretation. And that's something that the Cambridge School very much came out against, that history as a discipline has in recent decades very much come out against. But that used to be the dominant way of reading historical texts. Read them for your moment, this idea that they're transcendent, they always have relevance, they're always important to return to. Uh, you know, a lot of the Straussians are involved in that kind of way of reading or thinking. Not to say that Matt is a Straussian, but there is something a little bit more Straussian about that kind of approach. Uh, and so in thinking about that, I, I think that a lot of the time people get kind of fixed on, you need to read these texts as a historian, or you need to read these texts as a philosopher. I come from political theory, so I like to tarry with the tension between those possible readings. That's always there. You can always read someone against themselves like Zizek does, or in a new way you know, to address a new situation. Uh, and you can always read someone to try to get a sense of history and, and of what the world used to be like. They're both important purposes. And if you have enough time energy, you can even get, you know, develop both readings at once. You can even be aware of both readings at the same time. And you might even get to a point where you are aware that there's multiple ways of reading the period. And there's also multiple ways of using the theorist now, not just one way in either direction. And so then at that point, your set of options for what you do with the text becomes really, really huge and immense. You know, I was at uh, the, a platypus conference in Berlin a couple months back. We were talking about Lenin. 
And there's there's all this discussion about, well, what did Lenin intend? And haven't Lenin's intentions been forgotten? And they have, right? But of course, if we just go around telling people that Lenin's intentions have been forgotten, you don't know history, this is what really went on, that won't necessarily be the most effective way of getting them to engage constructively with what Lenin has to say, because not everybody is motivated by this historical interest that I think is a, a good and, and noble and worthwhile interest, but it's not one that reaches everybody. A lot of people are instead going, why are you talking about all of that when there's all of you know the consequences of what Lenin did? You know, maybe Lenin didn't mean to create this Soviet state, but that's what happened. So it doesn't that matter? Doesn't it matter what happened? Or what about the effects of the of the Soviet experience on our imagination, on our ability to think about different ways of being, uh, the skepticism that we have of ourselves and of our our higher uh, political impulses, because we're worried that somehow whatever it is that we believe in will get distorted or ruined along the way if we try to bring it into being. So we're scared to bring into being our ideals because of that history. You know, these are also important aspects of the legacy of Vladimir Lenin. You know, in addition to just all of the geopolitical consequences of all the things the Soviet Union did or tried to do while it existed, right? And all of these different parts of it are parts of it. They're all parts of it. And no one part of it is exclusively what Lenin is or exclusively what the Soviet Union is. The Soviet Union is this state that Western countries were scared of that they you know, made concessionary reforms in the face of to try to buy off their own workers. It's also this state that you know, uh, you know, committed all kinds of, of uh, horrible atrocities and stifled speech. It's also this state that you know, defeated Nazi Germany by uh, hyper-industrializing in a way that created famines and killed enormous numbers of people. You know, it has all these contradictory aspects. And all of this, all of this theory has all the, these contradictory uh, aspects and possibilities laden within it. And so I'm sure that uh, yeah, I, I'm sure that there will be a kind of difference in terms of what way Spencer prefers to read texts and what way Matt prefers to read texts. But I, I wonder if maybe we can get beyond that methodological difference and ask ourselves a bigger question, which is, is it good to read the text this way? Is it good to read Rawls the way Spencer reads Rawls or the way Matt reads Rawls? Uh, is it helpful? Will it help us have more time, energy, or make a better world? I think ultimately, all of these academic, you know, while history and philosophy are interesting in their own right, because we live in a world where there's exploitation and domination and people don't have unlimited time, we do ultimately have to ask ourselves, does this help people get more time, energy? Does it help people get more tutelage to read the work in this way? And if it doesn't, while it might be interesting to read the work in this or that way, uh, why are we why are we doing that? I think that's a perfect place to finish us out. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for visiting again. It was great to have you. Hope you have a great rest of your day and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. We cannot do direct revolution, but the only way to lay the foundation for it is to do what you are doing to move the underground. It's a theoretically correct title. Welcome to Theory Underground, a place for workers with earbuds who are tired of the bullshit and just want to get down to it. Big ideas, rigorous thinking, and ultimately, liberation from necessity. Research at Theory Underground focuses on what is most important for understanding our current situation. Theory of the subject, capital, time energy theory, critical media theory, CMT, and the most essential critiques necessary for understanding why the theory, ideology, and common sense of influencers left to right misses the mark. Theory Underground is coming to a city near you. Besides a commitment to publishing certain underground theorists and popularizing certain fundamental concepts, we have toured the United States and are touring Europe to promote our ideas, courses, and publications. You've been reading Underground Theory. Amazing book. I'm a publisher and an editor. I run and review of books. Literally, it's my living. This is the best edited collection I've ever read. Okay, picture the scene. America, early 2021. An Amazon warehouse worker arises from the emerging underground theory internet scene to create spaces for untimely topics and concerns that are too often neglected or kept in isolation today. Joined by a revolving cast of underground theorists, academics, and critics, he establishes what will become Theory Underground, 
a teaching, research and publishing platform by and for working class intellectuals, autodidacts and academics who want to do more than they're able to do within the confines of academia. That warehouse worker's name is David McCarricker and his book Time Energy is his first major contribution to the world of theory. It was recently reprinted with a foreword by none other than Slavoj Žižek, who also contributed to Theory Underground's latest book. Ah, ah, ah. My Bible, it's an excellent book. A collection of essays called Underground Theory. What you just heard is an excerpt from the Strange Exiles podcast, episode 23, where Bram from Strange Exiles interviewed me and Mikey. For those who don't know, Mikey is the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog. We are publishing one of his books here shortly at Theory Underground. He's also a lecturer at Theory Underground, and he's someone I've been friends and a collaborator with for over 10 years. But most importantly for you all, he's a fantastic lecturer, and it's a crime that he has to do wage labor right now. One of the long-term goals of Theory Underground has been now for a couple of years to hashtag free Mikey. That is something that I've been really pushing. But first, obviously, I have to get freed myself so the two of us are able to do this because, you know, as Mikey said, build it and they will come. Well, I tried and I built a website and platform. Uh, I had my own app and everything, but it's been really buggy and uh, it's more than one person can handle. And that's, you know what, a really good lesson for me. And so for now, what we're doing is moving it to a temporary intermediary platform until we are able to get some more serious funding. And ultimately, we want to be in a place like this, a real brick and mortar digital nomadic mecca where people can come from all over the world. But also the app was really expensive. And so by quitting it, I am now able to save a lot of money and with the help of my patrons and the students at Theory Underground, especially the monthly subscribers, I am officially able to quit Amazon and do Theory Underground full time. So thank you so much, everybody. This is one huge step forward. With that said, several subscribers did not migrate from the now defunct app to the new setup, and I'm guaranteed to lose people over time. So please, if you want to get involved, become a subscriber. If you're not even sure what this is all about, but are just curious, then I've added tier zero and tier one for very basic kinds of access to what we are doing behind the scenes. If you don't have any time or energy to get involved, but you do have some money to help support this project from afar, then please check out the Patreon. My patrons over at Patreon make the podcast and public YouTube possible. Thank you. As for once in a lifetime events, check out the new poster for the American Idiots Theory Underground European Book Tour. Paris, Brussels, Berlin, Vienna, Linz, Krakow, Glasgow, London, and Oxford from April 27th to May 25th, 2024. Two events are already fully booked out. Save a seat at an event by getting in contact with us ASAP. Finally, the call for proposals to our conference in Mexico. On What's up everybody, TUCon 2024 update here. It's not happening in Mexico anymore, but it is still happening on October 24th through the 27th. The change was made because a lot of the people that wanted to attend and that were expected to attend said they could probably afford to travel if they had more time advance notice. Uh, so save up for June 2025. Uh, if you have to choose, right? Because yeah. uh, other, it, this one that is happening this year is happening physically in Boise, Idaho because we have a lot of collaborators and fellow travelers and co-instructors there. But you can attend virtually for this one. You won't be able to attend virtually next year. Um, so yeah, if you have to choose, attend physically in 2025. The call for proposals already happened. The writing workshop for proposals already happened. You can still get the links to both of those. Just shoot us a message and ask for those links. We'll get you those. And the form goes live on June 1st and the deadline is June 15th. So if you're attending physically, let me know ASAP. Get in on it. All right, finally, last little thing here is to say thank you so much to my patrons over at Patreon. The Patreon is for people who are too busy to be students or subscribers at Theory Underground, but who want to see more of this free content on the podcast and YouTube channel for Theory Underground. You are the ones 
who see something of value in the free content being made available here and you want to see more of it. Your patron pledges at Patreon are a real motivator for me. So thank you so much. Especially thanks to Marilyn Lawrence, Bert Vanderkar, Carl Vanderlip, Nikolai, Sahil Kumar, Suxandra, Darian Large, Tyler Murphy, Max Mackin, Al, Algeri, Ben Rosenblum, Court Atlantic Airlines, Melissa, Matt Payne, Neil C, Sammy Condon, Yiz, and Schwabkinson. Thank you.